Hi everyone, my name is VJ Mooney. I'm an entry level occupational therapist who really likes hands and upper extremity. I do eventually want to get to my CHC soon. I know many students are struggling with understanding the basics of hands. I hope this video helps with breaking down the basics in anatomy and some of the most common nerve conditions. And each week I'll post different topics such as splinting, fractures, or other conditions that may help you or at least make more sense to you. So for this video, I decided to break it down into the radial, median, and ulnar nerve. And each nerve, as you can see, I talked about the different muscle groups involved. So with your radial nerve, you can see your extensor muscles, like your wrist extensors, finger extensors, elbow extensors, thumb extensors, as well as your supinator, brachioradialis, and abductor pollicis longus. And with your median and ulnar nerve, we're gonna be talking about your wrist flexors, finger flexors, your lumbricals, and your median nerve also innervates your pronators as well as your thumb muscles, such as your flexor pollicis longus, flexor pollicis brevis, opponens pollicis, and abductor pollicis brevis. And your ulnar nerve further innervates the hypothenar muscles, such as your opponens digiti minimi, flexor digiti minimi, and abductor digiti minimi. They also innervate your flexor pollicis brevis and your adductor pollicis, as well as your palmar and dorsal interossi. And in this slide, we're gonna be talking about the sensory distribution of nerves. So with this picture, as you can see, the, this is where all the sensory receptors for each of these nerves are located. So as you can see in the dorsal view or the back view of the hand, you can see mostly the radial nerve as well as the ulnar nerve innervating the little finger and your ring finger. And in the volar view, meaning the front of the hand, right, the ventral view, you can see where your median and ulnar nerves are. And you can also look back into the last diagram that I showed you with the chart and about each muscle group innervated by what nerves. And you know, that may also help you with just remembering. So if you ever see somebody in a clinic or on an exam or something, and you're always trying to figure out, oh, this nerve condition, what muscles does this nerve affect? Always think about this picture. And if you can remember that in the dorsal view or the back of the hand, right, you see a larger radial nerve innervation, you can think about your wrist extensors, right? And you can do the same with the median and ulnar nerve. And for this picture, I broke it down so you guys can see this more clearly. On the left, you can see you have the nerve and the different muscle groups and the specific muscles that are innervated by the radial nerves. And obviously on the right, you can see the particular muscles that arise from, from the radial nerve. And as you can see with the median nerve, same thing, the left side, you see the muscle groups. And on the right, you can see the specific muscles that are innervated by the median nerve. And with the ulnar nerve, as you can see, we have the muscle groups on the left and the specific muscles on the right. And again, I'm going to post this onto my website soon. So you'll see the PowerPoints as well as this video and you can follow along with it. So when we're evaluating nerve injuries, we always want to perform an occupational profile, right? We always want to look at, okay, how did this nerve affect this person's ability to perform their daily occupation? Does it affect dressing, grooming? bathing, what about making a meal? We also want to review any tests that were conducted, such as an EMG test, x-rays, or an MRI. We can also perform any provocative tests to see if we can assess if the nerve is irritated. And we can also perform any functional assessments, such as the Jepson hand function test, or really any test that can simulate ADLs and IADLs. So we want to always see how can this nerve injury, or any, really any injury, affect their daily activities. And finally, we can do sensory testing. And sensory testing will help us assess where's the location of the sensation issue, or if there are, is any sensory issues and so on. And we can use these results to help us plan for our treatment and update our plan of care. We also want to relate any of these findings back to the physician about the results of our assessment and we always want to keep them in the loop. And now let's talk about treatment of nerve injuries. So we can do some splinting, range of motion, edema control, sensory re-education, or sensory desensitization. 
activity and work modification, strengthening, nerve gliding, surgical interventions, and physical agents modalities. So when we talk about sensory re-education, we always want to remember that before we can do this, we have to assess and understand that our patient needs to have at least a protective level of sensation. Then we can perform any sensory desensitization if after surgical intervention, a person reports that they are feeling very hypersensitive in their scar area. And so we can do sensory desensitization to reduce that hypersensitivity. And using physical agents modalities may differ among the states. You just have to check with your particular state and see if you have to get any specialty certification or additional classes. The first condition we're going to talk about is Saturday night palsy. And with Saturday night palsy, the wrist extensors are affected. So remember when we first talked about with the radial nerve and how the radial nerve affects the extensors, such as your wrist and your fingers. So if there's Saturday night palsy, and the wrist extensors are paralyzed, you have no active wrist extension, right? If the wrist extensors are paralyzed, there's no extension happening. So what happens? Well, your wrist flexors are going to activate and they're going to flex your wrist, which is why the person may have a wrist drop, which is associated with Saturday night palsy. There's also sensory and motor involvement with posterior interosseous nerve palsy, just remember that it's a motor involvement. There are no sensory involvement, it's just motor. So there's severe pain in the forearm and elbow. The person may have the inability to extend fingers at the MP joint. There's weakness or loss of thumb extension and abduction. And there's weakness in ulnar wrist extension. So now let's talk about radial tunnel syndrome. With radial tunnel syndrome, there's dull, aching, burning pain around the lateral forearm. There's also going to be muscle weakness due to pain. And there's reports of tenderness in the lateral forearm. And now let's talk about Wardenburg syndrome. Wardenburg syndrome is different from Wardenburg sign. Wardenburg sign you can use to test for ulnar nerve palsy. But with Wardenburg syndrome, there's only sensory symptoms that are being presented. There are no motor deficits. So a person can complain of numbness, paresthesia, such as pins and needles, and also they're in such excruciating pain on their dorsal radial hand. And this is especially true because they will not be able to tolerate wearing a watch or handcuffs. So now let's talk about how the radial nerve affects occupational performance. So remember when we talked about the radial nerve innervating the wrist extensors, finger extensors, thumb extensors? Those muscles are going to be important, especially when we want to release an object. So people with a radial nerve injury are going to have a lot of difficulty with manipulating objects and extending their um, extensor muscles to release those objects. Imagine you're in a clinic and you're working with somebody on picking up a toothbrush, let's say, or picking up a bar of soap. So the person can grab it, but what about releasing it? That will prove difficult for that person. So you can grab the toothbrush and the bar of soap, but you're not going to be able to release it, right? So a radial nerve injury is going to cause the inability for an individual to conduct basic self-care. They can't release the object and they can't manipulate it, so it's going to affect their ability to perform basic self-care. Remember in school how we learned about tenodesis, and with some spinal cord patients, particularly at C6, they use tenodesis to perform their daily activities, right? And it's just extending your wrist actively, and then you have passive finger flexion. So if in a radial nerve injury, the extensions are affected, they're not going to be able to extend that wrist, right? So then the fingers won't passively flex with it and they won't be able to use it for their daily activities. So the radial nerve does play an important role with tenodesis function because again, that wrist extensors. So now let's talk about the median nerve. 
Carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the most common median nerve injuries. And with carpal tunnel syndrome, we know that there's night pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness in your hands, and there's also diminished fine motor control. If carpal tunnel isn't resolved, it can lead to permanent atrophy into the thenar eminence. And if the thenar eminence decreases and it just dies off, then the person's going to lose access to their thenar muscles, such as your flexor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis brevis, and opponent's pollicis. So they can lose that thumb opposition, right? And as for sensation, their sensory receptors we talked about originate from at the thumb, and they work their way towards the radial half of the ring finger. The ring finger plays such an important role because there's two nerves involved. On the radial half of the ring finger is the median nerve and the ulnar half of the ring finger is the ulnar nerve. And with carpal tunnel, a person is going to have difficulty performing their daily activities as they may not be able to turn the dial of their watch. They may not be able to tie their shoelaces. They're going to have difficulty with picking up small objects. So now let's talk about APAN deformity. APAN deformity is when a person loses precision pinch because of the loss of the abductor pollicis brevis and opponent pollicis, so the thumb cannot abduct. Now, remember in anatomy when we learned about the adductor pollicis? So with the adductor pollicis, which is innervated by the ulnar nerve, is gonna take over, right? Because there's no thumb abductor muscle happening, so the adductor pollicis will take over, and the adductor pollicis will force the hand to go into towards adduction. And so when the thumb loses its ability to pinch against the finger, the muscles in the hand begin to atrophy. And I got this image from Wikipedia. So now let's talk about hand benediction. So with hand benediction, which is also a median nerve injury, the index and middle finger are going to be affected. I know a lot of students have difficulty with understanding the difference between hand of benediction and ulnar claw hand. So with hand of benediction, it only occurs when a person tries to make a fist. So remember when we talked about the finger flexors, right? And lumbar goes one and two in the median nerve. So your lumbricals, your lumbricals function to flex your MCP joint and extend your IPs. So if your first two lumbricals, lumbricals one and two, which are innervated by the median nerve, stop working, or in their paralyzed, there's no MCP flexion. So your fingers just stay extended. Likewise, FDP, your flexor digitorum profundus, the first two are, in, are innervating the second and third digit. So your fingers can't bend on the IP joints, right? So if your finger flexors are paralyzed, your fingers are gonna stay extended. But what's also important to know is that with your ulnar nerve, the lumbricals and your flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis are not affected, right? Because again, different nerve. So your ring finger and your little finger can bend and there's gonna be no problems. It's just the second and third digit because they are innervated by the median nerve. So let's talk about AIM palsy, but anterior and outside nerve palsy is gonna be deep aching pain in the proximal forearm, which increases with activities. There is no sensory involvement, there's just motor involvement. So you're gonna see motor symptoms, not sensory symptoms. And as, and as a result, there's going, to be paralysis, there's going to be paralysis of the pronator quadratus, flexor pollicis longus, and the flexor digitorum profundus of the index and middle fingers. So with a person who does not have AIN palsy, they're able to make the OK sign or they can pinch. But a person with AIN palsy will not be able to. So as, so as you can see from this picture, they're not able to make the OK sign, also known as the Ballantine sign. And now with the pronator syndrome. So remember, your pronators are innervated by your median nerve. So there's going to be aching pain in the medial forearm or distal volar wrist. 
as well as paresthesia or pins and needles in the thumb, at, all the way to the radial half of the ring finger, right? Because again, that's going to be the sensory distribution of the median nerve. There's also going to be no night symptoms that occur, but you're going to see a loss of pin strength, fine motor skills, and you're just going to see clumsiness with the hand. So how does the median nerve affect occupational performance? Well, we talked about the thenar eminence and the thenar muscles. So with median nerve injury, there's going to be a loss of thumb opposition. There's also going to be a weakness of pinch and fine motor coordination is going to be affected as well as forearm pronation and any functional movements such as grasping via your phone or picking up a chocolate bar off the table. Those are all going to be affected with median nerve injuries. And as you can see from this picture, this person is struggling with putting the string in through the little b. So with a median nerve injury, this fine motor coordination is going to be an issue. So now we're going to talk about the ulnar nerve. So with the ulnar nerve, there are several ulnar nerve palsy tests that you can perform. The first one is the gene sign. So with the gene sign, you're going to ask your patient to grasp a piece of paper between their thumb and index finger. Then you're going to attempt to pull the paper from the patient. And then you're going to observe the patient with hyperextension of the thumb and P joint. And with the gene sign, as you know, there's going to be paralysis of the adductor pollicis muscle, right? Because again, adductor pollicis is innervated by the ulnar nerve. So that's going to be affected. So then now you're gonna see hyperextension of the thumbs and P joint because the adductor pollicis isn't working. And now we're gonna talk about the Froman sign. So with the Froman sign, you're going to have a patient grasp a piece of paper between their thumb and index fingertips of both hands. So then you as a therapist are gonna pull on the paper. The thumb with the ulnar palsy flexes at the IP joint while the uninjured thumb will not flex. And as you can see that there's no adductor pollicis, right? Because the flexor pollicis longus is innervated by the median nerve, it's gonna substitute for the weak or absent adductor pollicis muscle. And it's gonna cause the thumb to go into hyperflexion. And finally, we're gonna talk about Wardenberg's sign. Remember, Wardenberg's sign is different from Wardenberg's syndrome. Remember how we talked about Wardenberg's syndrome with the radial nerve? It is going to be sensory involvement, right? Wardenberg's sign, again, different from Wardenberg's syndrome. With Wardenberg's sign, it's a test for ulnar nerve palsy. And the third palmar interossi is weak due to being innervated by the ulnar nerve, right? And the eccentric digit minimi, which is innervated by the radial nerve, is not going to be opposed. So it's going to be extending the fifth finger. So now let's talk about cubital tunnel. With cubital tunnel, this aching pain on the inside of the elbow, there's also pins and needle of the small finger, ulnar half of the ring finger, and the ulnar dorsal hand. With cubital tunnel, you're gonna see night symptoms and hand pain. You're also gonna see weak grip and clumsiness, as well as a claw hand. And with cubital tunnel, you should always know and educate anybody you see with cubital tunnel that if you keep your elbow into flexion, it's just gonna place more pressure onto the cubital tunnel in which the ulnar nerve is located. So you're just gonna aggravate it. So you always want to avoid activities and prolonged elbow flexion. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about claw hand. With ulnar claw hand, there's going to be ulnar clawing of the ring and small finger due to paralysis of the ulnar innervated interossi and lumbrical muscles. Remember with the lumbrical muscles, we talked about how it flexes the MPs and assists with extending the IPs and the interossi muscles, your palmar and dorsal interossi muscles also help with MP flexion and assisting with IP extension. But your palmar interossi muscle is also going to adduct the fingers and your dorsal interossi muscles are going to abduct the fingers, right? So remember pad and dab, palmar adduction and dorsal abduction. So with a claw hand deformity, remember that the lumbricals and the interossi muscles aren't working. So there's going to be no MP flexion that occurs, but the extensor digitorum communis 
right, which is innervated by the radial nerve, still works, and that's just going to pull the MP joints into hyperextension, right? If the MP joints aren't pulled into flexion and there's nothing opposing, the EDC is going to pull the MP joints into hyperextension. And the IP joints are going to be pulled into a position of flexion because the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus are such strong finger flexors. And remember that the claw hand is going to be at rest, right? So, so the patient doesn't have to do anything. They can just be at rest and they'll demonstrate a claw hand. Whereas with the hand of benediction, it only appears when the person tries to actively make a fist. And finally, we're going to talk about Guillaume's canal. With Guillaume's canal, there are potential causes of compression, such as the gangling hook of the hammock, Fracture, there's going to be ulnar artery thrombosis, synovitis, repetitive trauma, and ulnar sided wrist instability. The symptoms will differ based on the zone in which the ulnar nerve is compressed. Sensory symptoms of pain and pins and needles are in the fifth digit and the ulnar half of the ring finger or fourth digit. These symptoms are usually worse at night and are exacerbated by prolonged wrist flexion or extension. There may also be a loss of motor function of the intrinsic hand muscles that are, that are innervated by the ulnar nerve. And as the hand becomes more clumsy, the muscles controlled by the ulnar nerve becomes weaker. And finally, the last thing we're going to talk about tonight is how does the ulnar nerve affect occupational performance? Well, if the ulnar nerve is affected and, or paralyzed, then there's going to be a loss of grip strength, such as holding a golf club. The person is also going to have difficulty with gross grasp, such as manipulating a doorknob. They're also not going to be able to perform in-hand manipulation tasks, such as if you're in AC or Vegas and you decided to play slot machines and you try to reach for quarters or like those dollar coins in your hand and you try to move them up into a slot machine. You're not going to be able to do that with an ulnar nerve injury. And finally, the person may have difficulty with lateral pinch, such as not being able to turn a key into the door or using your car keys to turn on the ignition. And that concludes our lecture for tonight. Um, again, I'll post content every week so we can go over different concepts and hopefully it just helps you in understanding the basics of the anatomy and the basics of nerve conditions a little better. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, OTVJ. So with that being said, good night, and I'll see you guys next week.